Genesis 6. We've got enough uh, people here for the first time. Let me give a little summary. Um, was it four months ago? I don't know. Was it January? We started in Genesis. I was hoping to get through with Noah and the flood by tonight, but we didn't make it. Uh, that's okay. We're not in a hurry. But next fall, we will start with Noah. So right here where we end today, we'll start with Noah and the flood, and we're just going to keep working through Genesis. Nobody's in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. Um, and I've never preached this, at least this part of Genesis, so I'm really enjoying it. But so far we've seen the creation. We've seen the, the formation. We've seen the deformation. When sin comes... All creation was deformed, sort of unformed, or uh, there was a, something toxic placed in God's good creation, and it's called sin. And then we've been seeing how God is trying to transform or reform or conform. It's fun to work with the word form. Uh, and there's most people he doesn't have very good success with, the great majority are about to get washed away in a flood. But there's a few shining examples that we saw last week, particularly Enoch, who walked with God, and uh, Noah, who walked with God. But we didn't really study Noah. We just found out who his daddy was and that he was a good man. And he found grace, which is what we're going to see today. Um, so these verses are notoriously difficult. Uh, we talked about some of that last week. I'm not going to repeat what I said last week, but let me uh, read eight verses. <clears throat> when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, or shall not contend with man. Uh, it's the only place in the Bible that verb is used, abide or contend. So there's a lot of debate on what that verb really means. But my spirit will not always be working in man. Pretty interesting statement that God says, my, there, there's, it sounds like he's saying there's a limit which is what we're getting to when we get to the flood. Is there a limit to grace? That sounds heretical to even ask the question. We just sang about grace. Okay, but my spirit will not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these are the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that some of the intentions of the thoughts of his heart were evil occasionally. I love to read it wrongly, one, to see if you're paying attention, but two, to help you to realize how dramatic this is. The Lord saw that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil all the time. That's about as stark a condition as I can imagine. And the Lord, what verb do you have there? grieved or regretted or was sorry. It's an emotional term. A lot of people think God doesn't have emotions. The Greek said if God has emotions, he's not God because that means he's changing. Well, the Bible doesn't talk that way. God was, God regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. When you see evil on the earth, or on the evening news, 
What's the emotion that you feel? Grief is about the fourth one that I feel. <laughs> it's usually anger, or I want to throw something, or that's not a good response, not the best response. God's response is a good one, grief. Um, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry, or I regret, or some translations, I repent that I made them. We're going to come back to this. What do you do when God repents? I am so glad you asked. Um, verse 8, but Noah found favor or grace. The first word, the first time the word grace appears in human history is right there. In this, in this polluted moral environment, there was one man who found grace. Let me read a few more verses just so we get a little more context. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless King James, I think, says perfect. Anybody got King James? But yeah, is it perfect? He was a perfect man, righteous, and Noah, like Enoch, walked with God. And he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. When Cain killed his brother, that was just the precursor of a bloodbath. Okay? Let's see how we're doing. All right. Is it ever too late? Just if you're new, uh, we follow this, these notes. I wander around. I talk from them. Um, and usually I fill in the blanks for you. But um, if I miss one, you just let me know. On the Niagara River, above the falls, I'm told, I've never found it, I want to see it sometime, but I'm told there's a big sign that's visible to boaters that says, this is the point of no return. That'll preach right there. There's a sermon, there's a sermon there. In other words, the current at that point is so strong whether you're in a canoe or whether you're in a 400 horsepower speedboat, you do not have the ability to get out of the current. You will go over the falls. It's a point of no return. That's a pretty good way to introduce the flood. You know, is, what is the point where God concluded, I'm done? That's what we're talking about. Um, as I've worked on this this week in Andrew Lloyd's Weber. This came to me. Uh, Phantom of the Opera. I don't know if you've watched it. This is, this is dark. Uh, it's got beautiful music. I mean, it's, it'll, um, it'll stir your soul, the music, but some of the, and this is, the, the blank there is the darkest, at least in my humble opinion, and most terrifying scene is when the Phantom is seducing Christine, and it's not really a sexual scene, although it's seductive, but it, it's not about that, it's about the words that are an evil man is causing a naive woman to give her will to someone else. To, to, and these are, I'm not going to sing it for you, but past the point of no return, I don't know if that rings a bell. No going back now. Our passion play has now at last begun. Past all thought of right and wrong. Think of, and she was singing that to him. He had already sung to her. And then they both sing together. Past the point of no return. The final threshold. The bridge is crossed. So stand and watch it burn. We've passed the point of no return. I mean, that's, that is the introduction to an affair if there ever was an introduction. In other words, we're going through it, and once we go into it, there's no going back. 
Well, that's a good introduction to what we're talking about. Whether we are talking about physical reality, like rapids, or like health, there's, there's, um, or epidemics, points of no return, or business ventures, there's some vis business that you reach a point and the business can't recover, or the business is certainly going to be a Fortune 500. It, there's, a, there's a point. Or relationships, we can discern a critical moment when everything hangs in the balance. And I think that's what we saw in the passage I just read. Sons of, God, sons of God are marrying daughters of men. God says, I'm not going to put up with this forever. He looks and he discovers every intention of the thoughts of their hearts, only evil. He grieves and then he makes a decision. I'm done. I'm going to wash them all away. Except Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Did you learn that in vacation Bible school growing up? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there is amazing, marvelous, wonderful grace. But oh my goodness. Um, the judgment that is around it. Though there has been a lengthy period of time building up to this point, and there will be a lengthy period that follows, the moment itself is absolutely critical. Once this threshold is crossed, there is no going back. This is the tipping point. Uh, and I've got a little footnote there. If you've read that book by Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point, it's really a good book. But he starts off by talking about, do you remember the hush puppy craze? Uh, it's like this is, I love books like this. They're just hush puppy craze. Yeah, I do. And he says, well, how did that craze start? And he said there was a tipping point when suddenly, you know, everybody in America felt they ought to wear hush puppies. And it's like, <laughs> how did that happen? It's like, or and I put on the, some of the other ones like smoking, you know, can, is it, or remember pet rocks? <laughs> or teen suicides. Why is it when there's one suicide very often? This, I mean, this is serious. It goes two ways. Um, I just, and I threw in my own Izod shirts. Oh, my goodness, in high school, if you didn't have an alligator on your shirt, you were not in. I just, that, that was an unwritten code that was, and where did that come? Well, there was a tipping point. Something happened. And this is what we're trying to say. Why did the flood occur? Why did God reach a point where he say, said, I'm done? I'm going to start again. Genesis 6, 1 to 8, describes one such tipping point in human history. On two levels, we see realities reaching a boiling point so that a point of no return is reached. On one level, we see humans. Once sin entered the human heart in Genesis 3, for chapter 4, 5, and 6, you see this downward spiral in moral depravity and inhumanity. Think of that word inhuman. That's such a God created humans. And to be inhuman, that's a pretty strong word, uh, went from bad to worse until humans became so depraved that they became irredeemable. First time I wrote that was unredeemable. And my spell check let me do it, but I debated, is it unredeemable or irredeemable? But beyond the ability of God's grace to redeem. I think that's what I read. When every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time, I think what we have is a picture of the human condition that is so twisted, so inhuman, that not even grace can save. So one thing we're going to talk about is where is the tipping point in a human soul, in my soul, 
in yours, where at least theoretically, I turn my back on God to such a degree that I've passed the point of no return. I think that's what the New Testament is getting at when it talks about there is a sin that leads to death. And John says, I don't even ask you to pray for them. There is a sin that leads to death, but not all sin leads to death. It's what Jesus, I think, was talking about in the unforgivable sin. Um, yeah, and I, I tremble when I write the word that not even God could save them. When we get to chapter 18, God, three visitors come to visit Abraham, and they first of all say Sarah's going to have a baby, and then God says, shall I tell Abraham, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he says, no, I'm going to tell him. So he says, we're headed to Sodom because the outcry of Sodom is so great, we're going to destroy them. They've reached the point of no return. And that's where God says, in reference to the baby, that a 90-year-old woman is about to have, is anything too hard for the Lord? No, nope. God can make a 90-year-old woman pregnant. That's a piece of cake. But the question is, can God save Sodom? Can God save Sodom? But the other could or should question is number two here. Where's the tipping point in God? On watching this descent down the slippery slope of wickedness and corruption, God too reaches a tipping point. There came a point when he repented, that's the word that's used, of his decision to make men and women and decided to wipe them out, the Creator became the destroyer. And again, when I write these things down, it's like, whoa, that's, is that the right way to say it? You're, you're, you're free to dismiss my words. You're always free to do that. You're free to disagree with me. But I want to get you in Scripture. Well, you tell me what the flood means. And what caused God to say, I'm done. They're beyond redemption. And I'm not ready to say there's a limit to God's grace, because I don't think there is a limit to God's grace. But there is a limit to what grace can do in a heart that has grown callous and hard. I, I, I think. And I think that's what Scripture teaches. You, you wrestle with this. And, okay. E. Our study will focus on these two tipping points. In other words, when does man become irredeemable, and when does God say, I'm going to judge the world? So why are we doing this? One, this is interesting history. It's interesting Bible study. But it's these four things that really make me excited tonight about this topic. One is, it gives us a better understanding of God. Who do we worship? Are we aware that we're worshiping a God who might change his mind. <laughs> I don't even, uh, I tremble to say those words. And in my, we don't ever do our questions for discussion, but one of my questions is, does that thought comfort you or does it terrify you? That the God you worship, his character never changes, but his actions do. And sometimes they hinge on what we do. Does that thought comfort you? Or to say, I don't want to, I, I want a God who's more predictable than that. And a lot of people do. And I think I'd say, well, try Allah. Allah is very predictable. That I'm being tongue in cheek. <laughs> Let me keep going. Number two, I'm excited about this study because number two, it helps us to better understand ourselves. I don't know what you think when you look at yourself in the mirror and what level of sin you think you're capable of. <laughs> and I don't even know if I want to encourage you to think about that too much. But uh, there are depths of perversity in the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's Jeremiah 17, 9. Um, I was preaching on deception one time at 
Loudonville, I, and I remember so clearly because sometimes I try to get people to respond, and I was on the verge of saying, how many of you struggle with self-deception? And then I realized, that's a stupid question. Because <laughs> the whole nature of self-deception is, I'm not deceived. They may be, Quentin may be deceived, but not, not me. That's what deception looks like. That's what people step into hell with. I didn't think I was going to end up. I lived my whole life with another set of assumptions. It's like, is my heart capable of that level of deception? If I know scripture, you better believe it is. You better believe it is. It very much is. Okay, third, I'm really excited about this because this study helps us understand why cultures die. Why did God destroy Sodom? That's a very good question. That is a, why did God destroy Babylon? Why did God destroy Rome? And where does America come into this equation? And when is judgment coming? Is judgment coming? And does this relate to the 21st century in the culture we live in? And to me, it's, it's, that's a no-brainer. It, it has everything to say to that. And fourth, to try to end on a positive note, it helps us better understand how revival comes. Because it's not just what makes God decide to destroy a nation, but it's what causes God to change a nation. If you like history, study England and France in the 18th century. They were right across the channel from each other, and they were on very similar paths and had very similar moral problems. But in England, there was a fellow named George Whitfield and John Wesley and company. And they had a revival, and God, I think, did some pretty amazing things through England. That France turned into a reign of terror, literally, a reign of terror. And why? You study that and try to answer that. It, and I think it relates to this question. Where, uh, where is the tipping point in God? Where is the tipping point in us? Okay, let's talk about the tipping point in human nature. I'm going to do this quickly. In our last session, if you were here last week, we called it, I called it Rotten to the Core. We examined the depths of human wickedness and the doctrine of... Help me. What did we study? Total depravity. And I quoted G.K. Chesterton, which I love the quote. He said, this is the most unpopular of all doctrines, but it is the easiest one to prove. <laughs> totally depraved. Not partly depraved. Total depravity. Without repeating what we learned there, let me look at it this way. Let's look at the progression of sin stain on human nature and cultures that is outlined in these opening chapters of Genesis. Okay, so what I'm going to do is start in Genesis 3 and walk us to Genesis 6 so that we see that sin got worse and worse and worse to the point where God's conclusion was is they're irredeemable. And if they keep having babies, it's just going to perpetuate and get more people involved in broken, shattered lives. Aren't you glad you came tonight? You're not smiling at me. Darlene's smiling at me. She's encouraging me. Um, so Adam and Eve. Now listen to this. You, if, hopefully you remember it. Genesis 3. Here is the initial plunge in the river. So I'm picturing us up above the Niagara Falls, or on the Niagara River. So Eve dips her toe in the water, and then she gets in. All right, she's committed sin, and then she says, Honey, why don't you get in the water with me? The water's safe up here. It's sin, but the currents, we're not even aware of it here, really. Here's the initial plunge in the river. Eve listens to the snake and is deceived. 
So she didn't wake up that morning like Cain did in the next chapter saying, I'm going to kill my brother. Eve woke up saying, no, I'm going to serve God today. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to walk in the cool of the day with God. And, this, and she was deceived. That's one kind of sin. It's, it's sin. It'll send you to hell. But it's not willful. It's not premeditated. It's not continual. It's when you realize what's happened, you tend to say, oh my goodness, God help me. Okay? And, which is what basically Eve did. Adam is passive. A few weeks ago I quoted um, Larry Crabb's book, The Silence of Adam. It's one of those books that it's worth the price of the book for the title. The si and his point is, males tend to be passive. And when it comes to sin, this is not good. But again, Adam is not waking up saying, I want to break something, I want to hurt somebody. He's just sort of saying, whatever you say, dear. <laughs> Where's the remote? You know, it's like, I, I'm, he's passive. Well, that'll send you to hell too. But the current's not real strong there. It's just, it's sin. Um, Adam is passive and goes along with his wife's suggestion. The couple immediately experienced three important words. Anybody remember what they were? This is guilt, fear, shame. I want you to remember these, because by the time you get to Lamech in chapter 4, and the, every intent of the thought of their hearts, there's no fear, there's no guilt, there's no shame. That's when you know this is the point of no return. But right now, Adam and Eve discover their sin, and they say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm exposed. How can I cover? These are good signs. I'm ashamed, I feel guilty, and I'm afraid of God. Those are healthy responses to sin. It's people that don't feel guilt, don't feel shame, and they're not afraid of God. That's when judgment is at the gates. We're going to see, okay? Uh, and they begin to blame one another. They regret what they've done and confess and repent. Now, chapter 4. Next story. We saw this about three weeks ago. Cain. Here the current in the river becomes stronger, and Cain refuses to heed God's warning. Remember, before he killed his brother, God makes a personal visit. This is impressive. To Cain, and says, Cain, why is your face fallen? Don't do this. I mean, what would you do if God showed up and said, I know you're thinking about some things you shouldn't do. Please don't do it. I mean, I I'd like to think most of them would say, God, thank you for stopping me from doing something really, really stupid. Cain, Cain said, I'm not going to listen to you. His sin is premeditated and cruel. You know, Adam and Eve, what did they do? They ate a fruit. What's the big deal with eating a fruit? Uh, it's hard to even relate. Is that so bad? Well, Cain kills his brother during church. Now we're in sin that, okay, that looks like sin there for sure. Um, even after his murderous deed, he hardens his heart and refuses to confess his sin. Though he feels terrible about the consequences, remember he says, Lord, my, my sin is greater than I can bear. It's like, no, it's not. You're not sorry that you killed your brother. You're sorry you got kicked out of the garden, and for the consequences of what you did. It's like when you're caught in school for cheating, you know, suddenly you become, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. No, you're not sorry. You're sorry you got caught. You're sorry you're gonna, your parents are going to get a phone call. That's what, you, and that's Cain. He expresses no remorse. When I read Genesis 4, I cannot find an ounce of regret that Cain ever said, what was wrong with me? I killed my brother. I, I, he's, he's a wicked man. He even resents that God is holding him accountable. End of chapter 4. Uh, remember Lamech. Lamech is the guy. He has two wives. Let's look at it. Um, because some of you, just so you hear, chapter 4. Uh, verse 19. 
Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Adah, the name of the other was Zillah. And they had three kids, Jabal, Jubal, Tubal, Cain, oh, and, a, and a daughter named Nama. Verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Adah, Zillah, so this is the second piece of poetry or music in history. The first piece of poetry was written by Adam when he first laid eyes on Eve. And he suddenly became a poet. You know, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And, uh, but this is the second one, written by a polygamist and a murderer. So a lot of the arts have Christian base, but a lot of the arts have pagan base. Visit the Louvre in Paris. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's, you'll see both. Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me. He wounded me, but I killed him. And I'm going to sing about it. I'm not going to... Cain killed a man and tried to hide it. That's at least a good impulse. He's, he knows he did something wrong. Lamech, he says, I killed a man. I'm going to write a song about it. They're going to sing about it and talk about me three millennia from now. And a young man for striking me. Cain's revenge is sevenfold. Lamech's is seventy-seven fold. So, I'm at letter C there, Lamech. The river now turns into class four rapids. We're in a new, I just, uh, and I, I, don't worry about how my mind works. Just, uh, the river, you can still get out of the current. There's still a possibility of salvation with Lamech, but Lamech is a bad dude. I mean, Adam and Eve were, they, they were just sort of dysfunctional and messed up. Cain was evil. Lamech celebrate. He builds a whole civilization on his treachery. The river now turns into class four rapids as Lamech willfully, brazenly, and continually. Key words here. At least Cain... I don't know that he killed anybody else. He killed one person, you know, once. <laughs> that's, that's bad, 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 but it's, it's got a limit to it. And the, uh, but Lamech is willful, brazen, continually defies God's plan. For marriage, I think Lamech said, I know God's plan for marriage is one man and one woman, but when you tamper with marriage and when you are killing the innocent, civilization is in trouble. When it's a question of marriage and a question of life. Welcome to 21st century America. I hope you see the parallels. Um, like Cain, he too murders a man, but rather than trying to cover up his deed and keep it secret, he boasts about it and even writes a song about it. Lamech feels no guilt, no shame, and no fear of God. Think about Adam and Eve. And even Cain, they had a measure of guilt, shame, and they were afraid of God. Lamech, <laughs> what's there to be guilty of? Why should I be ashamed? And who is this God? And he'll make a joke. You are in Heavy current at this point. This is, we are moving toward the waterfall. There's time, but this is getting serious. Um, Lamech, just the opposite. He brings his sin out of the closet. I choose my words. I choose my words. It's one thing to do sins in the closet. They're still sins. They can still send you to hell. But when you're ashamed of the things you ought to be ashamed for, at least that's, that's a sign of hope. Lamech says, why do I need to kill somebody in the closet? He brings his sin out of the closet. He identifies with his sin. If, if I struggled with shoplifting, let me just try to pick a safe topic here. I mean, I really just, I sort of can't help myself. I just, 
shoplift. But if you said, Stan, you're a thief, I think I would say, no, I'm, I'm, I just occasionally struggle with shoplifting. But don't call me a thief. I don't identify with my sin. You hearing me? When sin becomes our identity, and this is why the LGBTQ issues are, 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 are different. We're not, people, we're not talking about people who say, I have tendencies. I mean, we're talking about people who are saying, this is who I am. God made me this way. And I'm going to celebrate it and expect you to celebrate it with me. That is of a different nature. And we are a lot further down the river if I understand Scripture. I, I'm getting, I appreciate the nods I'm getting here. Um, then this is, I think, the tipping point. D, the verses I, I read at the opening of our session. The tipping point. So sin has been going down this slippery slope. Human sinfulness reaches the point of no return and will be swept to destruction in a global, global flood when several factors come into play. One, the sons of God intermarry with the daughters of men. And last week I told you my understanding of that, and I, it, I'd said it humbly, and I put question marks there just to let you know I'm not ready to be burned at the stake for this, but that it's basically the Sethites. The men began to call on the Lord in those days. Those were the descendants of Seth. Uh, Enoch was a descendant of Seth. Intermarry with the Canaanites, who were all like Lamech. Uh, but we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to back up the train for those of you that are uh, here tonight and weren't here last week. But the action seems, from God's point of view, to seal humanity's fate. In other words, when God saw that the sons of God were marrying the daughters of men, that's the point where God says, I'm done. That's a very interesting point. The culture has passed the point of no return. It appears that these illicit unions had diluted God's truth in such a way that human culture no longer had a moral compass. And I love that term, a moral compass. It's, a, it's in a culture where you know where north is, morally. You know how to define marriage, for example. You know how to protect life and the innocent, for example. You know stealing is wrong. And even if it's the government who's the one doing the stealing, it's still stealing or whatever. There, there's a moral compass that there's sort of a cultural consensus about. But when that is lost, and that's what seems to be lost in Genesis 6, truth dies, Jeremiah 7, 28. No one knows how to blush. That's one of the most interesting verses, I think, in the Bible. Were they ashamed at their immoral behavior? God says in Jeremiah, God says, no, they didn't know how to blush. You listen to talk radio. You listen to what's on television and things that even five years ago would make a sailor blush, you know, is how my mother would say it, but they're just, nobody blushes. Um, the ch everyone does what is right in his own eyes. The children of these marriages, and it wasn't just, I think the thing that, that was the tipping point for God, it wasn't just that these people are marrying, but they're having children. So what happens to children born when mommy and daddy don't have a moral compass. It's like bad things. And then when those children grow up and get married and have children, what happens to that generation? It's worse. And I think God, this is my understanding, God said the most merciful thing I can do to stop the pain of the brokenness is to send a flood. I think that's what he said about Sodom. The most merciful thing I can do 
And we'll, you know what was going on in Sodom. It was vile. It was violent. It was ugly. It was abusive in the worst sorts of way. And I think God said to allow them to keep perpetuating that for generations is cruel. That's my humble attempt to explain the judgment of God. I don't know if that gets it right, but you try. You try. Um, the children of these marriages have no hope of finding their way because of the polluted moral beliefs of their parents and grandparents. It's so interesting, even in like the millennial generation, you know, uh, that have grown up with all kinds of abuse and brokenness, but a lot of them will say, but my grandmother prays for me. You know, there, there's a memory, there, there's an anchor point somewhere, and a, but what do you do when there's no grandmother? And you've got enough generations. I don't know what you do. This is the place, secondly, where God says God removes his spirit. My spirit will no longer strive with man forever. At the dawn of creation, Victor Hamilton's commentary gave me this thought. At the dawn of creation, when all was formless and void, the hovering spirit, remember, and uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and all was formless and void, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Um, the spirit played a key role in bringing order out of chaos. The departure of God's spirit will mean that the world will revert to chaos. The flood threatens to uncreate. The book of Ezekiel is all about Ichabod. Anybody know what the word Ichabod means? The glory is gone. It's when the glory, the Shekinah between the wings of the cherubim in the Holy of Holies, Ezekiel sees the glory leave the temple, go through the threshold, and leave Jerusalem. What does that mean? It means all hell's about to break loose. When God's Spirit is, is removed. And number three, the scriptures now describe what human culture is like when men and women live in continual, willful rebellion against God. Verses we read, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now the earth was corrupt and filled with violence and God saw the earth, behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. Um, e, I threw this in at the last minute. Um, this is a little side run. It is interesting to see how the tipping point in Genesis 6 is replicated in the story of God's destruction of Sodom. I've already been alluding to it several times. We'll get there probably about Christmas. <laughs> oh, it's probably going to be next Valentine's Day or so. I don't know. Um, Genesis 18 and 19. But it's another picture of when God said, I'm done. I am done. This situation is irredeemable, I, I think is what he's saying. Abraham intercedes, but it's, in this case, not sufficient. It saves Lot, who was a little questionable in his own right. Then he goes off to a cave and gets drunk and sleeps with his two daughters and gives birth to the Moabites and the Ammonites. It's like, okay, that's going to be a fun one to interpret. Okay. The tipping point for God, Roman numeral 3, I'm leaving some blanks there. Um, you can go online and find them. Um, I've basically said Roman numeral 3. Let me read the first paragraph. The divine dilemma. God's predicament. 
And again, that is an interesting way to say it. Can God sort of, I, I don't know the right way to say it, throw up his hands and say, oh my, what am I going to do? Uh, that's not the right image, I don't think, of the God I worship. But God has a dilemma. And the book of Romans is where Paul, you know, do I save them or do I destroy them? What do I do? Um, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? That's one of the prophets. God's, what's he going to do? God's predicament is that he must choose between two unpleasant alternatives. Because he loves humans, he longs to restore them to their created state of being. But because humans have rebelled against him and deformed all that he has made, their conduct continues to go from bad to worse. God's justice demands that the violence and corruption be stopped. But his love demands that he find a way to repair the damage that sin has caused and restore the men and women to their original state. So, what does he do? One, what God says. My spirit will not contend forever. We better listen to that. There are... I, I, I don't like the word limits, but there are barriers. There are limitations. I, I don't like the word. I just read his. My spirit will not contend forever. Number two, what God sees. Every intention is evil all the time. In all people everywhere. Number three, what God feels. He feels regret. And it grieved him to his heart. And so here's the tipping point for God. What God does. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created. For I repent that I made them. Can the immutable one, the word immutable means unchangeable. Can the unchangeable one change? And this is my short answer. A, God's character never changes. He's always holy. He's always good. He's always just. He's always wise. But B, yet his actions sometimes do change and maybe often change. And the best way um, I know how to say this is anybody who's ever raised a teenager understands this exactly. And it goes like this. It's Monday. Teenager comes in. Dad, can I have the car Friday night? Sure, you can have the car Friday night. By Thursday, there's been such a bad attitude in the house and uh, that dad says, you can't have the car tomorrow night. And you know what the teenager says. You're a liar. You changed. You gave me your word on Monday, and now you're lying. And a parent will often say something like this. I know you're probably not going to understand this, but the very same thing that made me say no on Monday, made me say yes on Monday, is making me say no on Thursday. And a teenager, you know, rolls their eyes and says, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But every parent understands it. I loved you on Monday with all my heart. I've emptied my bank accounts for you. I'd take a bullet for you. That was true on Monday, and that's true on Thursday. And that's what's motivating me. It's totally consistent in the heart of a father. It's not contradictory. God's character never changes. His actions do. Um, I think we've got to stop. And if you're new here, we do go to 8.15. Some of you thought we'd go to 8 o'clock and didn't, thought I didn't know what time it was. Um, 
Let me, um, let me introduce you to Jeremiah 18. Let me just, this, this, you can chew on this this summer. I think, I love Jeremiah, and he lived in a day like our day, and I think like Genesis 6 day. Things were falling apart. The Babylonians were at, the barbarians were at the gates. The government was corrupt. The church was asleep. And God said to Jeremiah, prophesy. And his most famous sermon was Jeremiah 18. And it wasn't a verbal sermon. It was a visual sermon. The words are very few. And let me read it to you. And I'll give you a three-point sermon in three minutes. I really will. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I'll let you hear my word. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at the wheel. And the wheel he was making of clay, what was Adam made of? Adam was made of dirt plus a little water. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he worked, reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can't I do with you as this potter has done? Please stand for the benediction. That's the sermon. Here's the three points, and it fits, I hope it fits to Genesis. I'm at letter B, if you want to write it down. Jeremiah's most famous sermon summarizes what I've been trying to say in Genesis in three poignant statements. One, the potter has a plan. God created Adam and Eve just like a potter takes a lump of clay and shapes and plans and says, I've got a good, wonderful future and plan for your life. Number two, the potter has a problem. The product is not turning out like he had hoped. The problem was with the clay, not with the potter. So what does the potter do? He just scoops up the clay, adds a little more water, boom, throws it back on the wheel. So that's okay. I'll start again. Are you listening to the sermon? Number three, the potter has a question. O oh, house of Israel, can't I do that with you? That's what God is saying to Cain. That's what God is saying to Lamech. That's what God is saying to the whole world before the flood. Can't we start again? And when people say, no, we can't. Why would we need to do that? I haven't done anything wrong. I feel no guilt. I'm not a fear, afraid of you. Then we harden into a shape like the clay. You two are flawed, marred by sin. Don't resist me. Do not harden into a shape I never intended. Because in the next chapter, chapter 19, God says to Jeremiah, now go to the potter's shop and buy a, a piece of pottery and take it to the potsherd gate and throw it because it's hardened and you can't reshape clay that has hardened into a shape the potter never intended. That's when judgment comes. That makes sense? It does to me. Let me, let me pray. Let's do that. Father, I suspect not a one of us tonight as we've been working through these incredibly interesting verses has not thought perhaps of a family member, perhaps of a church, perhaps of a nation. And we've had the question, is it possible they've reached the point of no return? 
is it possible there's a hardening going on that makes a work of grace impossible? Lord, those are terrifying questions, and especially when they're personal and when they have a name and a face on them. Lord, I pray you would work in us and thank you that there is no limits to grace, grace, wonderful grace. And thank you for the promise of Scripture that says where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. Lord, help us to live in those realities. And as long as there's life, we're going to live with the hope that you can do what perhaps to all outward circumstances seems impossible. We ask with you, we plead with you, we trust you. Work in our hearts, work through us in the lives of others. Dismiss us with your blessing and keep us in your care. In Jesus' name, amen.